Hey all you people, what is going on? I'm here in the 2004 Mustang GT with Mum. We are here in the 2011 Ford Mustang GT. Model S197s are special because they are the last of the Mustangs to get the solid rear axle and the first ones to get the Coyote V8. I mean, in a way, it's the last true to form muscle car Mustang there is. Would you say that the S550 is oriented more towards maybe road and track use rather than straight line acceleration? If so, I would agree with you. Suspension stiff, but not uncomfortable. Now when I bought this Mustang a year and a half ago, I had every intention of modifying it. But soon after, I realized that cars also came with maintenance costs. Especially, but not exclusively, American-made cars. My arms look so freaking long in this GoPro. Within the first two months of buying this car, I put over $4,000 into it. I needed a new clutch, a new battery, rotors and calipers, the differential and transmission fluid changed, as well as new front and rear sway bars. And then a couple months after, I had my AC compressor switched. And as we speak, the new Ford Performance sway bar, the, the rear one that I got, blew out like the, the bolt just sheared right off that was holding the bushing on it. Now it's clunking. Like, come on, really? What the, what the, what the frick? Separately, these are not expensive repairs, and for the most part, they're considered wear items. So at the time when I bought this car, I had only driven stick once. It was a Dodge Dakota in a regular cab, but it had a V8 swap in it. My friend who also had an S197 came down to Pennsylvania to pick it up with me so he could drive it back. I'm gonna look back at this and be like, you didn't know how to drive manual, Matt? What? And he said that the clutch was already kind of mushy and like the grabbing period is really short, you know, signs of an old clutch. Shifting in this thing. It's like pop, 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 pop. that's what it sounds like. Fact. Ooh, Audi R8 V10. Let's get out of my way. Get out. The racing stripes mean I go faster than you. Pass that song. Anyway, after about two to three weeks of stalling out in the most precarious places, I finally got a hang of it. And my clutch was absolute rubbish. Insert the picture of me stalling out in the Bourne Bridge in Cape Cod summer traffic. That's how I found out I needed a new battery. They had to stop four lanes of traffic on this bridge just to jumpstart me. If anyone knows Massachusetts drivers, they are not happy if someone blocks the road. And there's a learning curve when anyone starts to drive manual, even if you switch between manual shifting cars, you know, it's, everything's a little different, you have to get the hang of it. And when you first start out, there's a lot of fine muscle movement in your left leg when you, when you have to fill out that grabbing period in the clutch. You can't let it out too fast or you stall. You can't let it out too slow because you'll burn your clutch out. I have a pair of Borla Stinger S-Type mufflers on the back of here, and I, I think it makes the car sound nearly perfect. i probably consider getting like an X-Pipe in the future. Other than that, the only real aftermarket part I put on this car is a K&N Typhoon cold air intake, which is an awesome air intake. I noticed the power difference. It's small, but I noticed it. And the sound, it makes it sound a little raspier too. It's awesome. I also recently took a trip to Mexico where I brought the car up to 147. I don't have an aftermarket tune on this car, so the governor just, just killed the engine power at 147. Also, for people who've never driven over 100 miles an hour, you start to notice body roll a lot more. <laughs> 
in this car there was also a strange like high-pitched kind of whine I don't know I've, I've read some forums and it apparently might be the differential making that noise Ooh! okay I see a co-worker here's Adam Perry in his Saab 93 let's race him oh my god smoked him. He was really trying. <laughs> Ooh, going through a tunnel. Ooh. One thing about the solid rear axles is that you don't want to floor it over bumps. It starts to just bounce around and get all loosey-goosey and it's probably not good for your drivetrain either. Alright, Becky, buckle up. No, no car is perfect. A couple of my biggest gripes with this car, just to name a few, the size of the fuel tank, I wish it was, you know, maybe three gallons bigger, four gallons bigger. Rear seat headroom. I went on a road trip with my girlfriend, one of my best friends, and his girlfriend, and they were miserable. They said that they'd rather ride on the roof than the back seat. I don't think it's that bad. I actually think it's pretty supportive back there, under your thigh gaps. Oh, that crackle's so nice. Becky, cut that shit out. Another gripe is the relatively unsupportive front seats. They're not bad by any means. I just wish they had a little more side bolstering. Uh, maybe an adjustable lumbar for the passenger. And the lumbar, since I bought it, has been broken in this seat. I think it's just the switch. The interior component quality is pretty bad. I mean, the dash is nice and soft. The headliner's great. But there's a ton of just cheap plastics everywhere. I mean, like, just cheap plastics and sharp edges, some of which are on the steering wheel, which you're always touching in the car. So it's like, what? why? Why Ford? This fake metal trim around bits and pieces in the car, not tightly glued down. I also think it would have been in Ford's benefit to offer this car maybe like an inch and a half lower from factory because the wheel well gap right now is just a little too much, you know. If there's just too much that gap, I don't know if that's ideal or not. Hold on, Becky! Whew. That was brisk. One of the downsides of driving stick. You can't do this. You can't hold hands as much. So pretty much anyone who has the same transmission in their car knows about the issue where it's easy to get locked out of gears. So I've done a few pulls against people on the highway, especially shifting from second to third, you'll get locked out sometimes. So it's also happened to me from fourth to fifth. But it's just stupid when a Hyundai Genesis Coupe flies right by you and your Mustang pride goes down the drain. All right, so finally one of my biggest issues with this car is the tendency for when you're shifting from first to second, the transmission pulls your hand from first to fourth. Ford seriously should have considered having this as an option, you know, to turn off like traction control or something. But instead it's uh, to save fuel. No, all it does is put yourself in danger of being hit by another car and seriously lug your engine when you go down to like a, a thousand RPMs and you're trying to accelerate in fourth. Now I know there are ways to get around this by disconnecting the solenoid underneath your car that, that is in charge of shifting, but this should have been an option from the factory. So after owning this car for about two years now, here are some of the things that I really love about it. In 2011, Ford managed to make the chassis of the Mustang somewhere between like 15 or 20% stiffer. And that really does translate into handling. It helps to turn an angle and the steering is very precise. Lots of feedback. It's super fun to go around corners too. And with all things considered, the limited drivetrain, uh, solid rear axle, that's a pretty big achievement. Alrighty, and I know this is completely subjective to opinion, but the late model S197s, I think, are gorgeous. Their, their lines are timeless. So they're right in that sweet spot between the early S197s, the 05, the 09, and the 2015 and up S550s. The early ones were a little flat and two-dimensional, but in 2010 it added some sort of three-dimensionality to it. It really is a car that you can get out of anytime and want to look back at it. That's how pretty I think they are. And no, they're not a super rare car. Everyone knows that. There's a ton of aftermarket support for them, more than almost any other car. And that just means you can take personalization to a whole new level. So yeah, they're not rare, but you make them special to you. <laughs> this engine is 
just sounds excellent. It's very unique sounding and just never gets old. <laughs> oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I can tell you what my <laughs> next <parking> spot was. <laughs> No matter what car you own, you're part of a subculture. It gives you opportunities to meet like-minded people that are also passionate Mustang owners. But the one thing that I love most about my Mustang is the psychological effects that it has on me. Having something that's an absolute pleasure to drive seriously plays a role in your day-to-day -day life. It makes you want to go to work. Driving stick makes you pay attention to the road. And it gives you an incredible opportunity to take pride in something that you love. And for that sole reason, it's absolutely worth owning. It doesn't matter what kind of car you have, it doesn't matter what kind of car you love. As long as you have a passion for it, you care about it, you know your car, you respect it. Real automotive enthusiasts will respect you because enthusiasts love the love of cars. Alrighty, stay tuned car lovers. Freaking fourth gear. Becky, don't just sit there and do something.